Hello and welcome to the Digitizing Europe Summit here in Berlin. I'm here today with Professor Gerhard Fettweiss, who is a professor at the Technical University of Dresden and um, uh, he also holds the Vodafone uh, Chair for Mobile Communication System. Welcome, Professor Fettweiss. Thank you. Um, professor Fettweiss, you're a specialist in 5G networks. What is that? Well, the fifth generation cellular is going to be, I think, a big revolution. So far, if we look at networks from first generation, second, third, fourth, we've been building networks to move content. Voice, data, video, graphics, whatever it is. Yes, delivering content, moving content, connecting to content, things like that. With the fifth generation, we want to build a control network to be able to control virtual and real objects. And that can be a big step up so that we can really control objects like robots in a factory, cars on the street, whatever you think of. And with that, I think our future is going to be pretty bright. And it's also very much about speed, the, the speed in which information will be transferred, isn't it? It is about, well, let's put it this way. There's speed to be measured in two ways. We have seen an increase in data rate that is delivered or deliverable about 10x every five years. Yes, the data rates have been increasing from 9.6 kilobit per second GPRS to date is 50 to 100 megabits with LTE. And this is exactly Moore's law, doubling every 18 months. So that's going to continue for the last, it has continued for the last 20 years, and it's going to continue probably for another 20 years. Besides that, however, we're seeing that if we want to control objects, it's about latency, so speed of reaction. So I, if I want to move an object, I want to see it move, it has to move at a latency at which my eyes feel comfortable. Typical experiment, put virtual reality goggles on, you move your head, and the screens have to move such that you don't get sick to your stomach. And that is, for a typical human being, a reaction time of one millisecond. Mm -hmm. And this is the time that our networks have to work at. And today's LTE 4G networks typically operate around 50 milliseconds. So that's a big step forward. Could you maybe give an example how, how these 5G technology or this 5G, 5G technology will change our everyday life, our, the world around us? I don't, could, could you give Let an give example? You two examples, yes. One sort of an education example. So if we look at Latin lessons today, yes, and we're sitting in the bench in Latin lessons, you typically see the sort of the kids going, falling asleep, yes? Sorry for making this movement, but I mean, uh, we still remember the, our class lessons in, in, in classes where we had difficulty staying awake. So confronting a pupil with a stream of information is not nearly as good in terms of learning speed as having the student being involved. So if the students were involved by having VR goggles on, speaker recognition, and they would be moving along this room here, around this room, and but in virtual reality animation, they would be moving in the old Rome and talk to each other in Latin, and the voice recognition system picks that up and sort of finds out, gives you points for correctly spoken language, uh, sentence, and things like that. So suddenly it becomes an interactive learning experience and things like not only Latin but English, history lessons, whatever all, uh, become really exciting and the speed of learning can be increased up to 10x by doing that. Yeah. And so that's a one ex example. Another example would be going to uh, factories of the future. Today we see that we have basically assembly lines with a lot of robots and we can produce like let's Take a car manufacturing plant where you can produce one model, yes, a million times. And what we really want, however, is to have individualized products. You want a different suit than th my suit, this person wants a different car than the other car, whatever it is, yes, you want us to have some little thing to differentiate. So what we need to be able to do is go from an assembly line where we can copy paste one product back to an assembly station with robots whizzing around in the factory, picking up the different parts that need to be picked up and assembling the individualized product on time, in time, as needed. So now we have to control the robots, and we, which have arms that can start resonating. Yes, so that needs, again, this millisecond tactile controls. This is factory automation is all about that. And then, obviously, we need stores 
design stores, not shopping malls of today, but design stores of the future where we go and we have a million new jobs being created by people helping us design our object of desire, whatever it is, that is then going to be manufactured. So it's, it's going to be a big job machine, this kind of thing. So you, you really think that, listen, listening to you, you really seem to be very optimistic that this development will create jobs because so many people are worried that the digital revolution will ultimately reduce the number of jobs and you know people are not really clear about that I mean yeah of course but I mean every let's say technological change also has gotten rid of jobs like I mean we were talking about it before with the washing machine when it was introduced in New York State alone it was a couple hundred thousand people lost their jobs that were washing before right I mean and if you go to this country here Germany there was the uprising of the weavers, remember that? Yes, I mean, basically it came to civil unrest mm -hmm. because suddenly there were weaving machines being introduced and there were many people without a job. So yes, it does change the way of employment over time. But what we always have seen is that the number of new jobs clearly outperforms what is lost in other sectors. Mm. And, and you are confident that this development will go on? I'm very way. confident that, that that will happen. Just think of individualization, what that will do. Just think of different levels of, levels of edutainment, education that you can do, entertainment that you can do with 5G. It's just going to create jobs in areas that we don't even believe to know today because we have no idea what's going to be coming. Because humans are endlessly creative and they just come up with new ideas of consumption and products and retail and customization and so forth. Exactly. So, I mean, and the fun part is also that we will see new companies pop up out of the blue. Yes, and take on a leadership position in an area that didn't exist before. So this is also fun, sort of seeing this creativity in industry and in startups and whatever all. And also absolutely, in my case, I think in academia. It's fun working with students. Yes, um, We will also talk today to uh, various politicians from Germany, from other countries, uh, from, um, from the EU, EU or from the Commission. And we would also like to think about political framework conditions we need in order for all these innovations to materialize and for researchers also to do good work and to have appropriate funding. If you were in charge of ruling a country or the European I, yeah, Commission, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, what, what, what do you think is, is really crucial at the moment in terms of framework and political conditions, political environment? So first of all, uh, we have to make sure that we stay away from a certain level of skepticism, mm -hmm. yes? But there always has been skepticism. I always like to use like the British, when the car was invented, there was the Red Flag Act and you had to have a, a person running in front of the car with a red flag warning everybody that a car is coming. Yes, otherwise you were not legally allowed to drive a car. So, I mean, this is nothing new for people to be skeptical of technology or thinking of what the articles that were written in the newspapers when the steam engine was invented and the first trains were running on steam engines. So this was like going to kill humanity. Um, so that's okay. And what we also have to understand is that the legal construct under which these new technologies and these new possibilities come up needs to be modified. So the current system doesn't work. I mean, if you take the legal system of 20 years ago and look at the internet today, you cannot apply that to the internet of today. So we have to understand that the whole legal system continuously has to be reinvented and re-engineered and not be afraid of it. Secondly, I think um, we have to make sure that we allow for leadership to be sometimes in a non-consensual way. That's politically a little bit difficult, so that would be one thing. So today, if you look at funding as it's done in the European Union on Horizon 2020 framework or whatever it is, or German government frameworks, it's always you want to get multiple companies and partners involved and build a consensus and whatever all. And if you look at the big Innovation breakthroughs like what happened in 3G dominated by Qualcomm, that was non-consensual. Yes, it was one company just blasting ahead and the others had to struggle and run behind. Mm -hmm. And you see this with a lot of these innovation steps that if you are too much based on a consensual basis, then the innovation doesn't happen in Europe, but happens outside of Europe in these areas. And so 
the, to have the guts to be non-consensual here and there is one of the things I would hope to be happening. Thank you very much, Professor Fettweiss, for your time. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> okay, super, das war großartig.